we're going to talk about photography. I'm going to give you my intro lecture, lecture to photography. It's not by any means a comprehensive lecture, uh, but it's kind of the basics to get you ready. Uh, we'll talk about how do you get better quality images, how do you compose images. We'll talk about compositional strategies um, to get you ready. And then you probably have already pre-read the exercise for today. Um, the first part of the exercise, you're going to find an example image that you think has good composition. You'll post that image and tell me uh, or tell the class what compositional technique they're using or what combination of compositional techniques they're using and why you think it's a good image. Uh, and then you go out and you will take a bunch of photos. I give you the rest of the lab period today to take those photos with the assumption that you're going to go out and take pictures. If you don't go out and take pictures and you go work on something else or whatever, that's okay with me. But before next class, you have to have all the pictures that I'm asking for. So I'll go through the list at the end. Uh, but you'll need those because next class when you come in here, we'll start in Photoshop and we'll start using those particular images. So uh, I want you to use your own images. I don't want you to find images online because you'll learn a lot more if you had to take the picture and you'll learn how you screwed up and then how to fix it, essentially. So we're going to talk today about introduction to photography. And I'll start first with a definition of terms, just so that we have some even playing field to, to, to kind of talk through. And, and when I talk about what a camera body is, you have some idea uh, of what that would be. So a camera body is essentially a light proof box. And that's what it originally was. It was a box with a piece of sensitive material in it, i.e. film. And you would expose that film to light temporarily, and that would give you your picture. It's come a long way. We don't use film anymore. It's all digital, but essentially it's the same concept. We have a light proof box. It has some kind of a sensor in it. In this case, it's not film anymore. It's a digital sensor. And you expose that digital sensor to light. That's how you take the picture. Aperture is the circular opening in the lens that lets the light into that camera body or into that light proof box. And so this is the same whether you're on a digital SLR big camera like you're a wedding photographer or whether you have your phone out and you're taking a picture, the concept is still the same. And that is that this is the amount of light that can get into the camera based on how open that lens is. And that can be very different, depending. Depth of field, and you guys have all seen this before too, is the amount of the final image that's actually in focus, the part that's sharp or the part that's clear. Generally speaking, the smaller the f-stop, and this is a weird one because we refer to aperture as f-stop, and it's kind of an inverse relationship. The smaller that number, the larger the aperture really is. So the more light that comes into the camera, the smaller the depth of field. So the bigger the, the lens is, the more light that comes into the camera, the narrower the depth of field. And I'll show you a slide that makes more sense of this. Um, it results in a blurred background, is essentially. So here's two examples. First one is an f1.8, so it's a very big aperture, a lot of light coming into the camera. 1 60th of a second in exposure, the ISO is at 1,000, uh, and it's a 50 millimeter lens. So I'm giving you just some parameters on how this particular image was shot. And if we look at this, we can see that really uh, just the, the edges of these flower petals right in here are in focus, and everything behind, everything going that way, and everything in front, everything going this way, is blurred out. So we're controlling what somebody's looking at by blurring out the background. And you've seen this happen like with portrait shots of people, where you have the nice glamour shot of the person and everything behind kind of blurs out and, and, and goes away. The opposite of that is this slide over here, where we have an f8, so a much smaller aperture, less light coming into the camera. Uh, it's 100, uh, 1 250th of a second with an ISO of 125 on a 135 millimeter lens, which is like a telephoto lens. And when we look at this, almost the whole picture from the foreground down in here to the plants all the way to the background, those hills there, those are all in focus. So it's the opposite. So for shooting in landscape, we're trying to capture the whole landscape. We don't want the background blurred. We're going to do the opposite. Sorry. I, apparently I talked too long. Oh, come on. Really? Yeah, I try. I try. All right, so here's another example. And I think this one helps kind of explain it a little bit more. So in this scenario, we have the aperture down here at the bottom. So this stuff is showing us what the camera lens looks like. So how much light is coming through. And then we see the tape measure here that shows us how much of the tape measure is in focus. 
So as we progress, and you can see this going as we go along here, when we get to the very end where the camera's wide open, you can see that's just a very little tiny bit that's in focus. And everything in front is completely blurred and everything behind is completely blurred. So these are the opposite ends of the spectrum. The smallest lens here is going to give us the most of the tape measure in focus. So I think this kind of helps set up that parameter. This is something that's important to know because you have to decide how much of that final image you want in focus, how much of it you want blurred based on the type of image you're going to be taking. Shutter speed is the other big factor. So we talked about aperture, depth of field, those are related. Shutter speed is the other thing that affects the overall exposure of the captured image. And that is how long is that light sensitive material, the film, the sensor in the camera, whatever it is, how long is that exposed to the light itself? And you can hear this if you think about, I mean, our phones don't do this anymore, but if you think about an old school camera, you could actually hear a click. You remember this a little bit vaguely in the back of your minds? Digital SLRs are great for this. There's a click because there's a mechanical lifting of a mirror. There's a mirror in there and it goes up and it goes down. And that up and down is what exposes the light sensitive material to the um, light itself. So shutter speed is the amount of time that that light is allowed to touch the sensor. And it's usually measured in seconds, and it's usually fractions of seconds. So a typical exposure is like 1 125th of a second. So it's really, really short, small amount of time. And so we're going to vary that time and get differing results. So I'm going to show you some examples here so that you can see kind of the uh, uh, contrast to each other. The first one is 1 50th of a second. And you see the image on the right. These are not images that I took. But in this particular example, you can see individual drops of water. It's, if, if we sped this up, if we did you know, one one thousandth of a second, and unfortunately I don't have that example, we'd see every individual speck of water frozen in time. It's kind of like when you see sports photography and you see the person running and you see everything frozen. It's that kind of a thing, where it's a really quick instant. In this scenario, we're seeing a few of those water drops. We can see the ripples in the pond just fine. But as we move forward, this is one tenth of a second. You can see that those droplets in the waterfall are going away. It's starting to become a streak rather than an individual drop. We can still see all the ripples in the pool. All of that still seems normal. As we move forward, half second, those, those streaks are becoming longer. The waterfall is becoming more uh, ethereal, more just this streak than individual droplets. The pond at the bottom with those ripples is starting to smooth out a little bit at a half second. If we go forward again, this is one second. You can see that the, the waterfall itself is becoming very blurred. And the pool is starting to smooth out at the bottom. There's very little ripples anymore at one second. Another example, side by side. 160th of a second, you see the frozen spray. I think this is a pretty good example right there. The alternative, almost the same image, same setup, is a four second exposure. And you can see that there is no spray here. It's all smoothed out. So everything that's moving becomes blurred. There's nothing to say that one of these images is better than the other. Either one of these is a great image. It's well composed, it looks nice. It's a matter of preference and what you're trying to show. Are you trying to show that blurring through time? Are you trying to show that movement or are you trying to freeze it as if it's an instant in time? And that's just the intent of the photographer, him or herself. ISO is another thing that affects the overall image. And you've seen this even though you don't realize you've seen this before. ISO is originally designed to mimic the, the film speed. So you used to, and believe it or not, I was old enough to actually do this, where you went into like the drugstore, and it wasn't CVS at the time, it was like Long's or something, and you went in, or maybe you went to Wolf Camera or one of those photo places, and you walked in and you said, I need to shoot some sports photography, I need really sensitive film, can I, can I buy some ISO 1000? Or can I buy some ISO 800? It was specific film, like it was, it was different. Or I'm doing standard photography, let me buy an ISO uh, of 100 and you'd load that in the back of your camera to take your picture. So you'd think ahead of time, God, I'm going to have to change the settings on the screensaver. Either that or I have to start talking less, one or the other. Oh, come on. OK, so 
When we get to the digital realm, we did the same thing. And all we do here is we can on the fly change how sensitive that little photo diode is in the camera. So we can say become more sensitive. So if there's less light in the room, it's kind of a dark scene, you can crank that ISO up and say, hey, be more sensitive so I don't have to have as much light coming in. I don't have to have a flash, for example. And some cameras are really good at that. Our phones are getting really good at doing this, so we don't need the flash anymore. The problem is, we can get this. Anybody taking a picture that looks like this, where we get all these little speckles in it? This is when the ISO gets too high. So our sensor becomes too sensitive, and it picks up artifacts. It picks up wrong colors. It's just cranked up too high. However, if we have a good camera, we might be able to boost that ISO up quite a lot and not get the distortion and not get those little artifacts in those weird colors. So a lot of the good cameras now are focused on increasing ISO without compromising the image quality itself. So here's a side by side as we go up from ISO 100 all the way up to ISO 3200, same image, same lighting conditions, and this shows you how it changes over time. So at an ISO 100, everything's pretty sharp. We can see the text clearly. By the time we move up you know, into, say, 1600 or 3200, we're starting to get that artifacting. It's not as clear anymore. So again, that's the sensitive sensitivity of the sensor in the camera. White balance, another thing that applies only to digital images, not to the old school film images. And you guys have probably experienced this as too, accidentally. Although cameras are starting to get a lot better, phones are getting a lot better at this. And this is where the, uh, the camera thinks that something that is white is white, but it turns out to be more blue. And I think it's easier to explain this by looking at the example. So you take the image on the left, and it just it doesn't quite look right. It looks like it's maybe slightly underwater or something. And that's because the camera isn't reading what true white is. And if we look carefully at this particular image, if we look at, say, the crosswalk there and there, that's where we can see the difference. So the white in this first image is really kind of a light blue. The white in the second image is actually a true white. So the camera has to determine what is really white in the scene and make sure that that is white and it doesn't skew the rest of the colors. If this happens, where you don't have the image right, the good news is it's really easy to fix in Photoshop. We can adjust the color scheme um, quite simply. Um, truth is, most of the time, your camera is going to do it right, especially in the new phones. Um, everybody uses their phone cameras now. Kind of become a non-issue. But it's certainly something to point out because it does happen. Bracketing. Bracketing is where you take a series of photographs, and I'm going to ask you guys to attempt to do this today, if you can. And what a bracketed set of photographs is, is it says, take the camera, take the photograph that looks correct. So if I was setting up an image and I was going to take a photograph of you guys in this room, let's say I was standing in this corner and I was going to take an image, the camera is going to pick up whatever it thinks the proper exposure would be. So assuming that you guys are the primary subject matter and I focus on you guys, it's going to expose you so that you're exposed correctly and I can see all of you in the final image. When that happens, Outside, the bright area is going to become too light. It's going to become all white in the image. And the shadows are going to be rather dark. So the things down by your feet, it's going to be rather dark. That's going to be what the correct image is. When I bracket, I take three images. So I take that image, but then in the same place, taking the same image, I expose for the outside. So I can see what the outside looks like. If I do that, all of you are going to be like totally dark in here, but the outside is going to be exposed correctly. Likewise, I go the opposite direction and I expose for down in the shadows, which makes all of you too light and it makes everything outside of the windows completely white and I don't see it. So I take those three images, it's always in odds, I could take five, I could take seven, staggering the values just a little bit, but I take those s uh, three images and then I can combine them together into something called a high dynamic range image, which always helps to see it. You guys have tried to take pictures of sunsets. They never quite turn out as good as the sunset itself, right? So that's where this kind of a technique can come into play, where you're getting the darks, you're getting the middles, and you're getting the lights, and you're fusing those three images together. So when I ask you to take a bracketed set in the handout today, what I'm asking you to do, some, some digital SLRs will do this automatically, which is really nice. What I'm actually asking you to do is I'm asking you to set up, can't win today. I'm asking you to set up 
your camera in a stationary spot, and most of you use like your iPhone or your, your, your phone of some kind. So you set up your camera in a stationary spot, you take the picture. Then you know how you can like push on the image and like drag and it'll make it lighter or it'll make it darker? You'll do that. You make, take the same image, you make one darker and you make one lighter. That'll give you those three images. That's how you're going to do it using uh, your phone. We'll spend a lot of time talking through, talking through high dynamic range images uh, in, a, in a separate lecture a little bit later on in the semester because it's something that's important for you to learn. Aperture and shutter speed have a relationship. They're dating. It's important to recognize that they're dating. Half the shutter speed needs twice the aperture to get the same amount of light into the, into the camera. So we have to open up the lens if we're going to decrease, uh, or if we're going to, ah, I'm going to get this screwed up. If the shutter speed goes down, or I guess goes up, this is where it's always confusing, right? So sh less time, it's a fraction. That's why you got to think through it. It's a fraction. So if you have the, the exposure for less time, you need more light to get into the camera, so the aperture needs to get bigger. That's what I was trying to say. Stumbled myself. So back when you used to have to figure out how to shoot images on your own, and this is something that if you were in a photography class, they'd probably make you really do, or you'd shoot full manual. All of us just take out our phones and take the picture. Makes life easy. But if you were taking this and you were, you were really trying to learn how to be a professional photographer, you would learn using tables like this, where we have a special exposure value for a particular type of scene. So let's look as an example here. If I was up, come on, there we go. If I was up here and I was saying, okay, this is a typical scene outside. Uh, it has hazy sunlight with soft shadows. I'd be looking for an exposure value of 14. So I take that value and I'd move to the next chart here. This is an exposure value chart. And I'd say, okay, well, I want an exposure value of 14. So there it is. And then I'm going to come up here to my aperture and I'm going to say, what do I want my aperture to be set at? So if I wanted my aperture to be set at, say, 2.8 right here, I'd come down the 2.8 column and right there it would give me an exposure uh, shutter speed of 1 2,000th of a second. If I wanted more of my scene to be in focus, maybe I'd use uh, an aperture of 22 and I'd come down here, right there, and I'd be at 1 30th of a second. So you'd use these charts to figure out what the proper exposures would be. The good news is this is not a photography class. I'm not going to make you memorize this kind of thing. You're going to go out and shoot in, quote, auto mode or semi-auto mode, which is going to take care of a lot of this for you. The camera is going to determine it. But it's important for you to be aware that this um, exists. Uh, and this is how you would do it if you were still in, uh, in manual mode. So that's exposure value. The next thing here is exposure compensation. Different topic. You guys have seen this. You've all interacted with it on your phones. And this is what I was talking about when I was talking about those bracketed photos where you say, ah, what I'm seeing in my phone doesn't quite look right. Let me drag it and make it deliberately a little bit darker or a little bit lighter because it's just not quite right. So we're compensating. The camera thinks this is right and we say, no, make that a little bit darker or make it a little bit lighter. Most of the time you go a little bit darker. You go to minus one or minus two. Let me show you an example. So this is our standard exposure in the center. If we deliberately want to make it lighter, we'd exposure compensate up in the plus value. So we start at zero, we go up to say one. Sometimes they're in fractions, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, one. So we go forward. Or we could take it and we could go decrease it to deliberately make it darker. And so this is just a visual thing. You see what you see on the back of the camera, you say, let me make it a little bit darker. Let me make it a little bit lighter. That's exposure compensation. A couple notes on lighting. So the thing about lighting is it changes throughout the day. Duh. The sun moves, so we're going to get different things depending on what time of day you go out and shoot your, your particular image. If you get up early in the morning and you go out and you shoot your images, you're going to get long shadows. We can see it. If we look outside right now, right, there's big shadows. The shadows are, are, are long on the ground. There's dark patches. There's light patches, etc. If I walked out at noon, I love it. I just can't win today. Um, if I walked out at noon and I took a picture, the shadows would look completely different. Almost everything would be in light. There wouldn't be long shadows. The shadows would be short. 
And so depending on what you're trying to do in your, your, your photograph, you're going to get different results. So let me show you, let me tell you an example. So I was in a, on a field school down in Peru, and we were documenting this, this site called Tambo, Colorado. It's a mud site. It never rains. It's in the desert. And um, it has some of the best preserved Incan uh, wall paintings. So we were down there, and it was a bunch of architecture students, and it was a bunch of archaeology students. And we were doing a variety of things. We were laser scanning, uh, we were photographing the walls, and whatever. And so you had these archaeology students, and you had the architecture students. So we'd get to the site. Um, it was early in the morning, we'd get there, and all the architecture students would be excited because we wanted to go out and we wanted to photograph things, we wanted to look at things because the shadows were big, you could see what the walls looked like and the relief, and it was, it was fun. All the archaeology students, they were like, yeah, whatever, we'll get out there a little bit later. They had their little snack and their coffee and, and whatever. Um, then it came time to, let's say, around noon, all the architecture students said, yeah, we're done, let's sit around and, and sit in the shade, let's take a siesta, you know. <laughs> And all the archaeology students would run out there and be all excited because it was the most even lighting for photographing the colors on the wall. There weren't any deep shadows. So it's just about intent. Do you want the deep shadows? Do you want to see that? Or do you want the opposite where you're seeing just the, the true color of what it looks like at noon? So you have to decide when's the right time and what's the right time uh, for you to be doing this and taking your pictures. All right, let's move forward here. Digital image file types. So in this case, we're talking about things that are, you're probably aware of already. JPEG, which is the Joint Experts, what is it? Joint Photographic Experts Group. Yeah, because you really need to know that. Right? This is the kind of thing that a jerk of a professor would put on a test, right? <laughs> no, I won't do it. Don't worry, there's no test in this class. It's the most common file type for all of your images. It's generally what comes out of everything. Uh, when in doubt, a JPEG's what's going to come out uh, at the end. So it's, it's good because it's nice and compressed. So we get a little, uh, a very small file size for what we're getting, but we're stripping out some of that resolution in the process. So if you zoom in on a JPEG, at some point it's going to start to get pixelated and not look as good. Uh, typically images are compressed about 10 to 1 without noticing too much. So instead of having uh, you know, a 10 megabyte file photograph, you shrink that all the way down to one megabyte, which is great for storage space. Although in this day and age, we have so much storage space, it kind of doesn't matter anymore. But it used to matter a lot more. PNG is kind of like a JPEG. You've probably heard of it. Maybe you haven't used it. It does allow for some lossless compression. So we can make it smaller without losing, without throwing and stripping away parts of the image, which is good. It's the most common for a lossless compression. It's going the direction, it's becoming more and more common. But the biggest thing about it, and the reason we're going to use it in this class a lot, is because it supports transparency. If we cut out the background of a particular object and we save it as a PNG, that background will stay cut out. On a JPEG file, if we cut out the background and we save the file, it's just going to fill the background with white. Not as good. So we'll end up using PNGs for that reason. Another type of file is a TIFF file. It's a tagged image file format. It can be lossless or lossy, depending on how you set up the compression. Most of the time, it's lossless. It's really popular for high-depth color images. So when you have a lot of data, it's a big file. You're preserving a bunch of that data in it. It is, however, very unusual to come out of a digital camera directly. The other and last type, which I think is something that's important to mention, is something called a raw image. And the raw image typically will come out of good quality cameras. And it's a way of capturing every piece of information that the camera has to offer. So we're not throwing away anything. We're not stripping it down. No surprise, these file types tend to be much larger than their JPEG counterparts. So we're at least six times larger, sometimes up to 10 times larger. But it's really flexible for your post-processing because you capture everything. So if you need to correct an exposure, you can do that. If you need to correct uh, a variety of other settings along the way, you have the most data possible to do that. Let me show you an example. So in this example here, I have an overexposed JPEG image, just some sighting. I go into Photoshop and I try to fix it and make it not so overexposed, and I get the image that's on the right. Still not very good. I'm not getting too much of the detail back in the white. It just looks a little bit darker. 
If, however, this original image, instead of being a JPEG, was a RAW file, I can take the overexposed RAW file and I can go back and adjust the exposure, and you see how different that post-processed image can be. So I now brought out all the detail that was in the paint that was lost, that was washed out. That's the difference between a JPEG and a RAW file. Unfortunately, if you work in the Apple ecosystem and you're working on your phone, they don't offer raw files coming out of your, out of your phone. They have their own quasi um, raw system, which essentially the goal there is it's kind of their live photos where you can go back and you can change which photo it took. It's kind of taking a mini video and then taking a still out of the video. So the presumption is if you screwed up your, your something blurred or whatever, you can pick a different key image out of that live image. So you can make adjustments that way. So it's kind of a hybrid system uh, in the Apple ecosystem. Anyway, on we go. So your camera, I, I threw a few of these slides in there because they're, uh, you'll see it in a second. It's so funny because it's retro. It's like 12 years ago I, I made this slide and it's pretty funny. Anyway, this is how the sensor works. This is much larger than the sensor that's in the back of your phone. You can tell it's a lot bigger. But this is how it works. Essentially there's some filters that allow the colors to be separated. So you can see um, as the light filters in, the sensor is picking up on red, green, and blue colors. We'll talk about color systems a little bit later. Uh, this is a, an additive color system, not a subtractive color system. Um, we'll explain that when we get to color theory down the road. Um, it interprets that data, and then it works through and figures out uh, what the image looks like, translates all those little individual pixels and colors, and puts them together into the final image itself. This was my retro slide. Anybody remember these? This was like the really popular digital camera. Everybody had one of these. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's pretty funny to look back at the typical compact camera circa, you know, 2007 <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm not even going to go there. But I, I, I couldn't, I was going to take it out. And I was like, no, it's pretty funny. I should leave it in. Uh, the digital SLR still exists. If you're like the wedding photographer or something, uh, this would be your camera of choice. The difference between uh, this kind of a camera and the, the camera that's built into our phones, there's two, two differences. One, it's huge. And two, you can change out the lens. So you can have higher quality lenses that let more light into the camera. If you think about a lens on one of these cameras, you know, it's like this big. If you look at the lens on the back of your phone, well, now there's multiple lenses on the back of your phone, but you get the idea. There, thank you. So, so if we compare the size of this lens to the size of this lens, there's a difference, right? So this can control and let a lot more light through the camera. You can get a lot more flexibility and you can get higher quality images. It's a little unfair in this day and age because what phone manufacturers have done, Apple in particular, but Samsung as well, is they said, you know what, we're going to compensate for the fact that we can't put this large of a lens on the camera. I mean, imagine what your phone would look like with that lens sticking on it. It would be silly, right? We can't do that, so we're going to start adding more lenses. So we're kind of tricking the whole system. We're taking multiple photos, we're fusing those photos together to get similar results to that uh, true digital SLR camera. So there is a distinct difference. So on those kinds of cameras, there typically are a variety of modes that are available um, that, you can, that you can work from. And in some cases, these same kinds of things exist on your phone. And if they exist, when you go to take your pictures, if you can pick one of these as opposed to true auto, you can get better image results. And so the things that I want to point out are landscape mode. If there's a landscape mode, essentially what it's doing is it's saying, OK, I want a very high aperture because I want everything to be in focus from the foreground to the background. So remember we talked about that, depth of field. We want a big depth of field. So let's go ahead and set that up for us because I want everything to be in focus. So don't think of it as I have to turn that on because I'm shooting a landscape. Think of it as I want to use that mode because I want everything in the photo to be in focus, even if it's a portrait or even if it's something close. The alternative to that would be portrait mode, which is essentially I want you to blur out the background, so give me a small depth of field now. So they set it up for you. The rest of the, the options don't really matter anymore. The only one, other one that I'll point out is the flower. Uh, this is macro mode. It's, it's for shooting things that are really close up, and it'll help you get things in focus when they're close up. Yeah? And the uh, night mode is just added to the 11. The night mode is essentially let the exposure run longer. And whenever you're in night mode, you're going to want to set your camera on something because you can never hold it still for that long. 
Um, so it's like one second, two second, ten second exposures where you're kind of getting that it's it's light. I need more. It's it's really dark outside, so I need more light coming into the camera. So let's let it sit and 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 expose more. Okay. So if you can switch into one of these modes, you're going to get better results long term. Configuring image options. This is another one of those slides that's kind of evolved a little bit over time. Um, I, I actually I heard something that was that I thought was really well put, and that is what's the, if somebody asks you, you know, what's the best kind of camera to buy? Well, the best kind of camera is the one that you carry with you that you can use. And so that's changed. I mean, in the old days where you used to hold like you used to carry like a razor flip phone, and you'd flip it out like, oh, I'm going to take a picture here, you know, click, you know. The image quality was so awful that it was like, oh, it's not even worth it. But the truth is, in this day and age, our phones are so good at taking photos that they're really the best camera because you always have it with you, so you can always take a picture. You know, when you're, can I borrow this again? When you're, when you're carrying this around, it's kind of awkward because you're like, you have to walk around with this camera dangling, right? I spent many a time walking through Disneyland with a camera like this. You know, and then I realized that I could get almost as good of pictures with this. This is a lot easier to carry than walking around with this. So you need to be aware that that's a trade-off. That's certainly something that you have to be aware of. The other thing on your phone is you never have to worry about how big your card is because there's plenty of space on your phone or it uploads to the cloud or whatever. On a camera like that, you have to think about how big is the card that I'm going to be shooting with. Do I have enough space on the card? Am I going to run out of space? That kind of thing. I mean, it's not as big of a deal because cards are so large now that you can take lots of pictures, et cetera. What's your final output going to be? That's essentially how, how large of files do I want? Do I want to strip it down? Do I want to take in RAW? In this day and age, if it's available to shoot in RAW, just do it and don't think, of, think twice about it. There's so much space available um, that you don't have to, have to worry about it too much. So what to carry? This is another one that's really fun. What to carry? Oh, got it. We're good. But if you're carrying something bigger, you got all this other stuff to carry. And that's, that's a trade-off. You know, I, had, I, have, I have this whole setup. I have, uh, it's a Nikon, not a Canon. But I have a Nikon. I have the backpack. I have the tripod. I've got all this gear. I used to travel with it. It was like my go-to backpack. I used to bring it in. I used to set it up. I used to show you guys that stuff. And now if I brought it in, you'll be like, why? <laughs> because we can get almost the same thing. And I always say almost the same thing, because it's not. It's not quite as good. It's good, but not quite as good. Um, so it means you can skip out on a lot of this stuff. When we get to panoramas, the panoramic tripod head and stuff is really good. Um, you get much better results. You'll, I'll give you some sample images that I shot with one of the, the, the images. It's a little bit easier than just trying to manually overlap your image. Uh, look at the weather and plan accordingly, because guess what? It'll rain. So I talked about being in Peru. This was uh, at toward the tail end of the trip in Peru. We went up to Machu Picchu, which was absolutely spectacular. I didn't realize that it was on my bucket list until I went there and then realized that it needed to be on my bucket list, and I'm glad I went. Uh, but of course, that day, it was pouring rain. It was the day we hiked the last part of the Inca Trail, and it was just dumping. And it was funny because all of us were there, and we all had like laptops and cameras, <laughs> all the stuff you don't want in the rain. So we were doing the whole poncho thing. Anyway, it happens. Let's go through some basic compositional techniques. So we talked about all the basics of photography. I want to come back and go through the basic compositional techniques because this is really how you get high quality images um, from your camera. First one. The other thing I should point out before I get into all of these is that on many images, there's multiple composition techniques at work. So it doesn't mean that you have just one. Oh, this one has the rule of thirds, but it also has a strong diagonal. So there's always multiples that can apply. But I tried to classify these into basic compositional techniques. So telling a story. So this is really about the mood of a photo, or it's about movement through the photo, trying to draw the person who's viewing the photo into the photo such that their eye wanders through the photo. So I have some options here. Uh, this one's in St. Peter's. This is, you could argue that this is a strong diagonal, but you've got this light beam that's coming down that's, that's landing on the floor. And it's a really powerful mo movement, uh, moment for taking a picture of a church, for example, because it's, it's really about what it feels like to be in the space. Another example, uh, this is up um, in the Swiss Alps. And you can see in this particular photo 
that there's a trail that starts, it actually winds its way right through that little crack, then it comes down here and winds its way all the way along here and way back over there. So you as a viewer get drawn to that little piece of trail and then you start following it along. So you get drawn into the photo. That's what this particular compositional technique tends to be about. Another example here, we've got just the simple path, but the path comes up looks at that tree and then kind of curves down and around. So you as the viewer start walking mentally along that path toward the tree, it focuses you into the tree and then you continue to go through the rest of the photo. So it's a little bit subjective, oops sorry, as we go through it. Another example, this one you can't see as well, this is up in the Andes. Um, symmetry. So this is a, a photograph where a strong symmetry dominates the photograph. So you have left side and right side match across each other, but you want one or a few elements to deliberately break that symmetry. So you have the symmetry and then you want to break it with something. So let's look at an example here. This is Brooklyn Bridge in New York. So we've got a strong symmetry. The structure is symmetrical, but we've got all the people on the right side and nobody on the left side. So it's activating the image. So you, you always want in a symmetrical photo to have something juxtaposing the other side. So we have the, the symmetry and then we break it on purpose. Another example here, we have the strong symmetry with the couch. The pile of dirt in the corner is different. It breaks it. So always focus on what breaks that symmetry. A radial composition is where you have something really strong at the very center of the photograph and all the elements go around that particular center. It can be really effective for setting up like a portrait shot of a family where you try to center everybody around somebody else. Um, but let me show you some examples. So this one, does, it's actually the air, it's the empty space that's the, the, the strong point of the, that radial focus. This is inside an ice cave in Switzerland. Um, if you can ever go ice climbing in Switzerland, it was awesome. Hanno, the ice climbing guide, he was great. Anyway, um, totally worth it, totally worth it. This was inside the cave looking out and you've got this symmetry between these two melting ice points. And it's right in the center and everything else works around the outside of that cave. So, tunnel vanishing into the distance. So we've got that center point of the, of, the, of the focus of the image and then everything radiates out from that center point. Next image here, I love this image, I think it's fantastic. Setting up the hot air balloon, we've got that strong center point, and then we've got all the radiating points coming out of it. And then you've got the people down at the bottom that kind of break that radial composition. Strong diagonal element captures your attention, directs your eye through the photograph for a strong diagonal. Could be ab abstract, so this is just sand on a beach. This should look familiar. This is that DVC book drop, but we've got the strong diagonal uh, that are opposing the 4x8 sheet of plywood form. Another example here of a strong diagonal, something in perspective. We've got the train and the tracks at night forming that strong diagonal. Overlapping layers. This is a good one for architectural photographs, where we're, we're photographing something that's in the foreground, something that's behind it, something that's behind that. God, you can tell that obviously my settings aren't, aren't quite right for uh, now that I'm back in the semester. Uh, everybody's a little rusty, right, when you come back. So overlapping layers. In this case, we have the door that leads to the wall with the window, which leads from the window into the space beyond. So it's, it's layering up as you go through. Uh, just for perspective, this is that Tambo, Colorado in Peru. You can see the preserved wall paints, um, mud buildings, very, very dry desert. Uh, but it was all these little rooms and niches and, and, you know, one space into the next space into the next. It doesn't have to be architectural, though. We can look at something like this that's in um, uh, just a landscape. And we can see the overlapping layers. We've got the foreground that would be this kind of meadow area, followed by the little bit of tree line. So I'd say this is number one. This is number two. Three would be the pond right there. Four would be this line of trees. Five would be this meadow. Six would be the horizon. So we're layering up as we go through in this composition. Now, of course, there's already, there's other rules that apply to this photograph as well. 
So if you take nothing else away from the lecture, I saved this toward, toward almost the end, and that is something called the rule of thirds. Anybody heard of the rule of thirds before? A couple people. Oh, all right, here we go. This is good. This applies to everything that you do from here forward. It applies to all of your um, you know, little posters that you make, all of your graphic compositions that go on the wall, everything this applies. And the rule of thirds is simply to take what you're showing and divide it into thirds. And we end up with that grid. There's nine squares in the grid. And we're going to take our primary elements and put them on the intersections of those grids. And just by doing that, you will instantly make your photographs, or your compositions for that matter, significantly better. And let me show you how. So here we got a picture of the Statue of Liberty. And so in this scenario, I could have taken this photo and centered on the Statue of Liberty. But notice that if I did that, it would deactivate the space. If, she was, if this photo was right here, for example, we were looking at it that way. We don't see, there's no space of what she's looking at. There's nothing about the context. It's just about, here's the element. People do this all the time when they take pictures of people. They say, okay, I'm just going to take a picture. I'll center the person right in the middle of the picture. It completely deactivates everything that's going on around the people. So what we want to do is we want to take all of that away, and we want to have our primary space right here in the photo. It's empty space, but it gives you a sense of what she's looking toward. So if we look ahead, there's our first rule of third. Right? So she's on that third line. The ground is also at a third. So we've centered it on those two rules of third. So look at this image. Same thing. The bow of the boat is about a third of the way over. It doesn't have to be exact, but it's about a third of the way over. And the top of the boat uh, is about a third of the way up. So again, we're composing it. What about if you're taking a picture of a person? We just talked about pictures of people. So same thing here, where we want the subject to fall about a third of the way over. And we want the eye line of the person to be right at about a third of the way down. So we're capturing the person, we're capturing the context, we have an understanding that he's sitting there looking out toward something. It's a very active image. Now this doesn't, and then this is part of why you can't just have a computer do this for you, this still takes a little bit of designer in you, is that technically this image, same image, still follows the rule of thirds. He's about a third of the way over, and his eyes are about a third of the way up. Is this a good image though? No, because we're capturing what's behind him. We don't care about that. So you want to think about how can you show where the person is and what they're looking at to try to capture this so where they fall in the rule of thirds really matters. So let's look at some more. This could be a strong diagonal. Clearly it could work as a strong diagonal. But it also works as a rule of thirds. And the reason that it works is because the helicopter is obviously coming around with its bucket. It's swinging through. And we understand that it's going into this open space. As opposed to just, here's the photograph of the helicopter. No space around it. So we see all that movement by having that extra little bit of space. Another example here, great blurred background. Nothing particularly exciting about this, the little coconut, but it still is a nice composition because it falls on the rule of third. OK, so this is the, the stereotypical, I climbed the mountain. can't win today. Stereotypical, I climbed the mountain. Let me take the picture because I arrived at the top of the mountain. If we just, and actually I should do this where I show this as a, uh, right, if I cut the image right here and we ignored the rest of the mountain for a second, it would be an image of the two of us standing on top of the mountain. Okay, that's cool. But by taking it with the rule of thirds, back that up for a second. We understand the context of where we came from and what, we're, what we accomplished. So it's not just about the two of us at the top of the mountain. It's about this is the two of us and look where we came from. It's a much different photograph by following that rule of thirds. Right? And our feet happen to fall about a third of the way up. It could be a landscape shot. The density of those cliffs all fall right on that 
rule of thirds. The bottom is about a third of the way up. The top here is also about a third of the way down. So we're framing that bay using those same rule of thirds. Framing. We're using strong lines in the photograph to frame something that's important. So this is a typical, like, I'm looking out of a window. So this was in Pompeii in Italy. We're looking at the Bay of Naples. It's framed in this, in this little circular window. So that becomes our frame for the context beyond. Patterns and repetition. This is the last one that I'll talk about, and then we'll, uh, we'll start working today on the lab. But patterns and repetition are also a fun way to compose an image, especially when you pay attention to where the pattern breaks. So it's kind of like the symmetry, where we set something up, and then we deliberately break it. Same thing happens with patterns and repetition. I love this image. I wish it was my image. It's not. You've got this, this pattern of repetition of all these balconies, one after the other after the other. They're all the same. They all look the same, except for the one t-shirt that's hanging over the balcony rail. That activates the pattern. Now, this would be a much stronger image if that t-shirt was right here, because then it would be on the oops, then it would be on that nice rule of thirds. And instead the t-shirt's the right in the center of the image. So it could be better but I still really like the image. Right? Same thing here where we've got this, this, this pattern works a little bit differently. It's going, it's receding away from us. We're seeing all those columns, all those light fixtures going back and back and back, and then the waiter's walking through. And we get that little flash of movement. Last one here, we've got the pattern of all the little grid bars, and then the snow is the active part. So obviously it's designed to knock off the snow to let the snow fall through, but we see little bits of snow hanging on. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do today in exercise 103, uh, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, what we're going to do is uh, under part one, you're going to find an image. Uh, consider looking like National Geographic has great images. Um, find an image that you really like. Think about what makes that image good. What's really strong about the composition? What makes it an, a, a, an interesting image in the first place? And so you're going to post that image, and then you're going to write a brief paragraph that outlines what compositional technique or techniques you believe the photographer used, and what other factors might make it a really good image. Is it depth of field? You know, what is it that makes this image good, based on the stuff that we just talked about? Okay. So you post that, and then after that, you're going to go out and take some various photographs. These photos are all things that you're going to need next class. Okay, so you're going to do that and you're going to go out and you're going to shoot these things. First one is five pictures that are buildings, five images of people. You might want to ask people if you could take their picture first. Sometimes people get really wigged out if you take their picture without asking them. So maybe take pictures of your friends or something like that. When I, when I talk about five images of people, please include the whole person. Don't cut them off at the waist. Feet all the way to the ground, all the way above their head. Include the whole person. There's a reason for this. We will use these later on in class, I promise you. So whole person, okay? Five detail images of textures or patterns. Remember, pattern repetition, break it with something. Okay? Five detail images of textures and patterns. Five photographs taken from unexpected angles. That means you can't take all of your pictures at eye level, which is what everybody always does. So you have to get high, you have to get low. So unexpected uh, angles. Whoops. I need the other half of the handout here. Here we go. Uh, four close-up photographs. So get really close to something and take pictures. Four of those. One bracketed set of images. You will try your best to do this. If you don't get it right, I have samples that you'll play with when we get to that lecture, but I'd like you to try. So remember, if you're doing it with your phone, you take the, you set your phone on something to start, take the first picture, deliberately under, deliberately over exposed to get three total images. One handheld set of panorama images, at least three images. This does not mean get out the pano mode on your phone and swing your phone. That's not what I'm asking for. There's a reason I'm asking for these separate images because I want to talk about how they come together, how we mask, how we combine images. So it's something for later. It doesn't have to be the best images. I just need those images. If yours don't turn out, I'll have samples for you to play with as well. So on all of these ones where I'm asking for something specific, like the bracketed set, if it doesn't work, I have samples. So it's just better if you actually take your own set uh, going forward. So when you go to take those, they need to overlap. 
it's best if they overlap by about a third. So if you have that rule of thirds grid on, just try to overlap by about a third as you take your pictures. Okay? So at least three pictures that overlap because we're going to combine those into one image down the road. Um, one self-portrait. And then I want you to take 25 or more images that you just want to take. 